courage in a broken world. Holy Spirit, I ask for your help today to communicate your truth from your word, to care for those who are present and watching online. Lord, would you minister in a thousand different ways today? Lord, we know that this world is broken and fallen, and we know your word is true. And so, Lord, I ask for your help to help me communicate your heart for everybody that's present and and watching online. And, And we pray that everyone would experience your love and care and mercy today. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, this past week, we began our Saving Grace 101 class, which is our introductory class to uh, the church, what we believe, uh, why we do the things that we do, and that's why those tables are set up over there. Last week, we had a great class, so we eat lunch together, and then we talk through material, and uh, at the round tables, people got to discuss the different things that we were um, learning and discussing, and one of the very first things we do in Saving Grace 101 is teach about the doctrine of Scripture, or what the Bible says about the Bible. That really, in many ways, is our starting place, and the reason for that is because the Bible is the truth. The Bible is absolutely true, and the Bible is the foundation for what we believe about God, about one another, about how we should live, and so we want to lay that foundation. And to set up our passage this morning, I just want to talk a little bit more about the Bible being our foundation, because today we're we're going to get into some difficult subject about marriage and divorce and remarriage, and uh, the Bible actually has quite a bit to say about it, and Jesus has quite a bit to, I think, minister to you in a very specific way, no matter who you are and where you're at in this spectrum. The Bible says this about itself. All Scripture is breathed out by God. That literally means expired by God, and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So in other words, this book is entirely like no other book. It is the absolute truth, it is the standard of truth, and it's what we need to conform to, because it's the revelation of who God is, how we can know him, and how we should live as followers of him. I want to read an excerpt from our class on the Bible says this, the reason that we must start with the Bible when speaking about what we believe about God is because it claims final authority in what is true about God and true about us. The Bible is first of all inspired by God, which means that that God's spirit spoke through the biblical writers. The Bible is infallible and inerrant, meaning that as God spoke through the biblical writers, their original manuscripts contain no errors or falsehood. Finally, the Bible is authoritative, meaning that it, was writ- it is the written word of God. It comes to us with the authority of the king of the universe. Therefore, we don't get to choose what parts of the Bible we embrace and what parts we throw out. God has spoken, and as his creation, we must obey. Since the Bible is inspired, infallible, and errant, and authoritative written word of God, We must base everything we believe about God and about ourselves and what God has says in the Bible and not our own preferences or the preferences of the wider culture, biases, or worldview. The Bible is always our starting place. Our beliefs and our feelings do not get a final authority, but rather they must be submitted to what the Bible says. Now this is true in every subject that the Bible speaks on. And because of this conviction, we generally preach through books of the Bible. Occasionally we'll do topical series, but generally we we preach through books of the Bible because we want to, to read the Bible in its context, and we want to get to uncomfortable subjects at times that we may not otherwise gravitate towards because we think that is healthy for us as Christians and as a local church, even if at times it can be a bit uncomfortable. So this morning's sermon is entitled Marriage in a Broken World. And we're going to look at 
what Jesus is teaching about marriage and a little bit about what Paul has to say about it as well. I want to say up front that you're going to most likely respond emotionally to something that is said at some point. What I'd ask you to do is, is, is try not to react, if that's possible, might not be possible, and hang in there to the end. Because this will build upon itself as we get through it. And then if you have questions, you have comments, you have thoughts, uh, you, you want to pray together, we would love to talk to you after church or throughout the week and encourage you. So listen to it as a whole, and then we'll work through it together. So look at Matthew 19. We're going to read through verses 1 through 12. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Matthew just makes another afterthought, and there's a bunch of people that were sick, and Jesus healed every single one of them. And Pharisees came up to him, the religious leaders came up to him to test him by asking him the following question. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? So they're trying to trap Jesus with a controversial question. And he answered them, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, Therefore man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. If you've been at a wedding, you often hear that. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? And he said, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. The di- disciples said to him, if, if, if this is the case, if, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have been made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God. Let the one who is able to receive, receive it. Three big ideas, three points we're going to see from this passage are this. We must uphold God's good design for marriage. We want to uphold God's good design for marriage. We must recognize sin's effect on marriage. We must have a category for marriage in a broken world. And we must follow God's calling for our life, either married or single. We must follow God's calling and support others in God's calling for life, either married or single. Take a look at the bulletin you might have got when you you came in today. Pull that out for a second. I'm going to read the questions that are in the bulletin that are for our discussion groups because they are going to really, I think, get the gears turning and show you no matter if you're married or single, this subject is relevant for church life in many, many different ways. So I'm going to ask questions. Don't don't answer them. Just you can think think of them yourself. And then at some point, I would encourage you, even if you're not in a small group, talk to somebody else about these questions. What words come to mind when you think of the idea of marriage? For some, it is good. For some, it is terrifying. For some, it's somewhere in the middle. Did you grow up with a positive or negative view of marriage? Why or why not? Maybe when you think of marriage, you think of your parents fighting and you hiding in your bedroom. Maybe when you think of marriage, you think of this beautiful romance between your mom and your dad. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle. This applies to all of us. How can we as a church care for those who are in the midst of a difficult marriage? 
How can we do that? How can we do that better? How, how can we, as a church, care, support, and encourage those who have been divorced? How can we show Christ's love to those who wanted a marriage and it didn't turn out the way they had desired? How might you help someone who is resistant to the idea of marriage? That it's just, eh. It's not, not a positive thought. And then how do we support, how do we encourage those who are single maybe and don't even want to be or maybe are called? How can we come alongside as a church and show God's love? How can we support, welcome, encourage those who are called to a life of singleness for the Lord? And then in general, how can we support marriages? Pray. You don't have to be married to support and encourage and pray for others who are married. So we're covering a lot of ground. Let's jump into the first point. We must uphold God's good design for marriage. See, the Pharisees are asking a trap question. And the reason they're asking a trap question, one is they wanted to trap Jesus. But in their, their time period, there was different schools of thought about divorce and marriage and remarriage. And the bar actually was very, very low to get a divorce. So some of the Jewish teachers taught if, if your wife made a bad meal, you could get a divorce. If you saw someone more attractive, you could get a divorce. So the, the bar slipped so low that the Pharisees knew that by Jesus answering that question, it was going to be polarizing. And like in any culture, there was a, a more liberal view of that and a more conservative view of that. Now Jesus wisely doesn't directly answer their question at first. He, he brings them back to a really high standard and bar that, that they probably weren't expecting. So look at verse 3. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking him, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And it's not talking about the, the civil law. It's talking about God's law. Is it permissible? And he answers them, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So God made Adam and God made Eve. And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one. What God has joined together, let no man separate. So what Jesus is doing at first here, he's taking them back to pre-sin in the world, pre-fall, God's good design and intention for marriage. And from this, we learn a couple of truths. And he's directly quoting a passage from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And remember, it all went south in Genesis 3. So all is good at this point. So God's good design is this. Marriage is God's good design between a man and a woman. That is God's good design. One man, one woman. Look again at verse 4. Have you read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So this is God's good design for humanity Marriage between a man and a woman. Marriage is intended to be a lifelong commitment between one man and one woman. Look at verse 5. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. Some translations say, older translations say, cleave to his wife. So you might have heard the phrase leave and cleave. It comes from this passage. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man separate. So marriage, God's good design, is intended to be a lifelong commitment between a man and a woman. And this joined together, the idea there is is like this adhesive, this glue that bonds so tightly that they 
they though individual sons and daughters of the Lord are one flesh, joined together. That is God's good design. And we learn from the Apostle Paul that marriage is intended to be a picture of Christ and the church. In Ephesians 5, quoting the Genesis passage, the Apostle Paul writes this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I'm, I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. So a marriage with Christ at the center between a Christian man and a Christian woman who are living to honor the Lord their, their marriage is to be a picture of Christ's love for the church. So as a church, as a Bible-believing Christian church, we want to uphold, support, and encourage marriages. So whether you're single or married, you should have that conviction from the Bible. And you should pray for one another. You should pray that marriages would be strengthened. Having that conviction then, there shouldn't be an easy off-ramp for divorce like was present in the Jewish culture, like you ate something that you didn't like and you can get a divorce. Or you avoid just difficulty not sinful difficulty, that you're just, you think, we're, we just don't like each other anymore. We're not compatible anymore. Well, for those of you who are newly married or haven't been married yet, when you get married, you think, a lot of times people get married, even Christians, oh, we have a lot in common. And then you realize, uh, we probably don't have as much in common as we thought, and we see the world very different just by nature of how God has made us. And if you've been married for any prolonged period of time, you change and your spouse changes. So you, you have to adapt and change. And so um, it's the, the commitment, this covenant before the Lord that makes you want to work hard and honor the Lord and love and sacrifice and serve and lay down your life for your spouse. You need that to be locked tight. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that. But that is God's original good intention. But remember, what's the original question? Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? So Jesus is going to begin to answer that question. And he's going to answer it very wisely and carefully. But before we we jump into that detail, I want want to address something else too, that there are many of us who have sinned in various ways before we knew Jesus. I mean, if we put a pile in the room, it'd be a big pile. And so we, we want to understand that, that, that Jesus came to save sinners of every stripe. And so the grace of God needs to be first and foremost as we work ourselves through and consider God's standards. So I want to read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral or idolaters or adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed by the blood of Jesus. You were sanctified by Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. You were made holy. That's what that word means. You were justified. You were clothed and covered with Christ's perfect righteousness in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. All of us fall short of God's standard. All of us are in need of a Savior and forgiveness And if you trust in Jesus, all of us have been forgiven. So we want to have a humble disposition when we think through God's standard for marriage. And then those who have made many mistakes or sins 
in their life. But if you're astute, by this point you have some questions. You should have some questions. Yeah, but what about this? And what about this? And what about this? Let's talk about all the whatabouts, which brings us to point two. We must recognize sin's effect on marriage. Verse seven, they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? They're talking about what's written in the book of Deuteronomy. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, because of the hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Sadly, we live in a broken world. And in the Old Testament, through the inspiration of God's Spirit, Moses writes, in principle, if there's indecency in the marriage, you can get a divorce and remarry. But Jesus is saying this wasn't God's original design. God's original design was that this marriage would go on forever. But Jesus understands that sin has affected all aspects of our lives, including the institute of marriage. And as you're wrestling through this, this is actually a book I would encourage everybody to read. The, the book is called What the Bible Says About Divorce and Remarriage by Wayne Groom. It's just a little nugget of a book. And the reason I would encourage everybody to read it is because we want to be a church family that can care for one another and have a category for complex and difficult marriages. In the Bible, don't react to this because I'm going to add some other things. But in the New Testament, divorce is explicitly, it's an important word, allowed or permitted in two cases that are clear. Those two cases are in the case of adultery and the case of desertion. Somebody abandons the marriage. In both cases, that doesn't mean divorce has to happen, but it does mean God allows divorce to happen and remarriage to follow after that. Look at verse 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So Jesus is saying, if someone commits adultery, breaks the marriage covenant, they may sin in such a way that the damage, the hurt is irreparable on the, on the other spouse. And he's saying it is permissible. In this room, over the years, we have had very godly people that have been in marriages that one of the spouses has sinned in this way, and they're, they're devastating. Some have chosen to continue in the marriage and experience the grace and transformation and forgiveness and cleansing, and some, the, the damage has just been too deep, too persistent, and at times the the sinning party doesn't want to repent or stop. So Jesus says that if that happens, it's permitted to get a divorce. And implied there is to remarry if that is what God would call you to do. Now I also want to speak a moment to those of you who have committed adultery. Whether you're online or you're in the room, there are some sins that we do that cause irreparable damage at times. However, that doesn't mean there are sins that we do that cannot be forgiven. So as a married woman or man, you may have repeatedly crossed a line that has destroyed your marriage. That does not mean as a human, your life is over. It means that you need to own your sin, repent of your sin, and be cleansed by the shed blood of Jesus and be renewed and restored. And to get help to think through, how did I get there and how can I never go there again? In this room also or watching online, there are probably some of you that are playing with fire right now. Now you may be looking up old friends or girlfriends or boyfriends 
Facebook or on Instagram, you're playing with fire. You haven't crossed the line, but you know you're playing with fire. You need to stop. You need to repent. You need to remember the covenant that you are in. There's another category of godly people in this room or watching online who love Jesus, who have been divorced, it had been heart-wrenching, and at times, I, I spoke with a man this week, and I asked if I could share this, I'm not gonna share his name, but he said I could share this, that there's just prolonged periods of time where he just feels like a second-class Christian, even though he had biblical permissible reasons to get a divorce, he still feels that way. As a church, we want to encourage and welcome all and remind people of the shed blood of Jesus, the righteousness of Christ, the, the fact that by nature we're all in the same playing field, and by grace we're all forgiven and adopted sons and daughters if we have faith and we repent. So if you're in that category, and I know there are some of you in that category, you love Jesus, you're pursuing Jesus, you, you, you're seeking after Jesus. It's not true that you're a second-class Christian. A Christian is someone who turns from their sins and trusts in Jesus and is born again and washed and cleansed and made new. And we're thrilled you're here. We're thrilled God has made you a part of this local church. The second explicit category that the Bible teaches for divorce and remarriage is in abandonment or desertion, meaning the spouse leaves the marriage. Look at 1 Corinthians behind me. Um, we're going to start at verse 12, chapter 7, verse 12. To the rest I say this, I not the Lord. What Paul means there, he's still under the inspiration of the Spirit, but Jesus didn't specifically address what he's going to say, but it is God's word, uh, Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit. That's all he means there. That if a brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. So this is in Corinthians, pagan culture. Um, some of the men and women became Christians while they were married, and one spouse is a believer, one is not. That's what he's talking about. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But, listen to this carefully, if the unbelieving partner separates, deserts the marriage, let it be so. In such cases, or in cases like these, the brother or sister is not enslaved, but has called you to peace. And the understanding there is that the, the brother or sister who has been the deserted one, who is left standing, maybe with the care of children as well, and this could be a man or a woman, is no longer enslaved, meaning they're, they're free to divorce and remarry. Now, if you're newer to the church, one of the things we encourage you, especially in these difficult subjects, study it for yourself. Be convinced for yourself. Not just because Dave or, or myself or one of the other pastors teaches it. This raises lots of questions. And if you're ever in that situation, the godly person in that situation is just weighing all the weight and pressure of all the cares and all the consequences and all, that this, all the implications of what this means. And so we would encourage you to seek out Christian counselors and sit down with pastors and other trusted, wise Christian friends for help and counsel and prayer to, to navigate it and, and consider these things. Now, what we wish is that Paul would have given more explanation. Okay, what does desertion mean? What does they leave mean? He doesn't give us a lot of detail there. But the idea is that they, they left, and then it says unbeliever. So I know at times men or women can twist this and say, well, I am a believer, so therefore you cannot 
divorce me even though I left you? Well, I could say I'm an NBA basketball player. But that doesn't mean I am. It just means I said I am. You look at me, 47 years old, I'm 5'8", and I can jump off the ground about six inches. I'm not an NBA basketball player. Somebody who willfully is neglecting their husband or wife and rebelling against the Lord may or may not be a Christian, but if they persist in it over time, over years, and there's just such a hardness of heart, I don't think it's unloving or untrue to say after all the things in Matthew 18 that Dave talked about last week, you appeal, you pray, you send a wider group, you appeal, you pray, you send a wider group, you appeal, you pray, you tell the church, they appeal, they pray. You're to, you're to treat them as an unbeliever. I think, I think many can fall into that category. So the two explicitly clear areas for how sin affects marriage and how it can be warrant a divorce and even remarriage are adultery and desertion. Now the question, if you're perceptive, you should have the question, well, what about, and what about, and what about? Are there additional categories for divorce and remarriage? This little book that I recommended by Wayne Grudem what he does in this book is one of the things he, he really hones in on is verse 15 of 1 Corinthians 7, where it says, But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. And in such cases, or in cases like these, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. So, how Wayne Grudem, through study and studying original language and, and studying how these, this phrase is used in other writings, he, he thinks an honest interpretation is, in this case and others that are similarly destructive or, or other actions that make a marriage irreparable. So what, what, what could those kind of things be? Physical abuse. If a husband is physically abusing his wife, physically abusing his children, causing irreparable damage, I don't think it's a stretch to put that into in such cases as these. And at times in Christian contexts, husbands will take this inspired, infallible, authoritative word and use it as a weapon and distort it and cause great harm and great confusion on their wife. If you're in that, you need to stop. You need to repent. You need to fear the Lord. You need to understand you are sinning against God's daughter. And it is evil. It is wrong to bring harm to the bride you were called to protect. And it's evil and wrong to use God's word for your sinful pleasure and desires. So that would be a case. That would be a legitimate, I think, case. And if you're in that, we want to help you as a church. And we know, we know from experience, this, these things are so difficult and complicated. And as a church, we want to support men or women who are in these situations. Oftentimes in this category, it is women who are on the receiving end of the sinful abuse. Now support at times looks like coming alongside. Sometimes they're just, the spouse is not ready to leave the marriage. Whether you think that is right or wrong, they need a loving friend to come alongside and support. Sometimes they are. And it's with great stakes and great danger. And we want to help them alongside. Just recently, I was at a pastor's meeting with the director of the Alice Paul House. And she was giving us counsel and advice of how, to, how as pastors to, to navigate and the resources that are available. And so there are good resources in our community as well. 
But I know, we, we know that you feel isolated, you feel trapped, you feel alone. And we pray, and we know the stakes are high, that you'd have the courage to tell someone, to bring others into it. In such cases, and I think that would warrant one. Here's another one. This could fall into the adultery category or the in such cases category. Is those who have spouses that are just headlong enslaved in pornography. Just headlong enslaved. Let me say this too. I know there's a number of guests here today. Every Sunday is not this heavy, but we believe that, that God's word is true and that we do not want to be a fake church that goes through the motions. And I know, having been a pastor for a long time, that people can sit in a church and do really bad things in secret. And so we think it's healthiest and brings the most honor to the Lord and the most freedom to you and the most God-glorifying way to us to get in and, and talk about these things. But prolonged addiction to pornography can cause irreparable effect on the spouse who is innocent. Same thing, talk to Christian counselors, seek pastoral help, seek wise counsel from Christians you know and trust. Other categories could be alcoholism, other drug addiction, gambling where someone is just racking up the debt and, and, and not doing any of the things they're commanded to do as a husband or wife. So as Christians, we want to get messy. The church is messy. We can either be a fake church or a messy church. The church, as many have said, is, it should be like, like an emergency room where there's triage happening and the mature are, are rolling up their sleeves and getting in and helping to care. And the wounded and the hurt are getting on the receiving end of care. So we want to get in there. So Jesus is getting into this and the disciples have a reaction that I think some of you in this room probably have right now who are not married. Well, if this is possible, if this is marriage, I'm out. I want nothing to do with it, which is the third and final point. We must follow God's calling for our life, either married or single. We're just going to kind of hit this at the high level. The disciples say to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. In other words, Jesus, if the bar is so high that we're to stay in this covenant, this promise between each other and we don't have an easy out we don't want to mess with it and he's trying to work through that with them now in our day and age which I don't think was uncommon in the Corinthians day and age either is a lot of times people want some of the benefits of marriage without the commitment of marriage and God says no and for your joy for your peace for your Obedience to Jesus as a follower of Christ, God says no. So then Jesus says this, but he said to them, not everyone who receives this saying, but only those to whom it is given. So this isn't for everybody, but for those who are called. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of righteousness. The last kind of eunuch there, he's using as a metaphor. There are some who feel called to a life of singleness for the Lord. So we must follow God's calling whether it's either married or single. And I want to speak especially to those of you who have grown up in broken families. Just because your mom and dad warred against each other doesn't mean that has to be so with you. Does not have to be so. There's a better way. See, Jesus makes things new. He brings forgiveness. He, he, he fills you with his spirit. Both Mary and I come from families that have divorced for um, legitimate reasons. And so both of us were navigating marriage in, in kind of a, a new way. And the Lord has helped us and is helping us. 
And especially for those of you who are young adults who are just, uh, eh, the Lord just has maybe calling you to it, and it could be beautiful. And there may be generations that come after you because of that. So you don't determine what God is calling you to. God determines. Some of you are single and want to be married. And as a church, we want to support you. We want to pray for you. We know churches can be hard for single adults because you look around and all you see is married people and children. You are part of this family and we are so glad that you're here. We are thrilled that you're here. And we don't have a quick answer of why God's not answering your prayers. But we do know, married or single, ultimate satisfaction doesn't come in a relationship with another human. It comes from Jesus. He's the living water. He's the satisfying one. That's true whether you are married or single. And so you want to keep your eyes on the Lord. So how do we, where do we go from here? Let's be a church that holds and supports and values the gift of marriage. Let's also recognize the devastation of sin and how it can mar and shatter, bless you, a marriage. Let's remember the hope we have in the gospel of Jesus. Maybe you're the one that really messed up. You're the offending spouse. There is hope for you in Jesus. That doesn't necessarily mean that your marriage will be restored. But it does mean you can be restored. Transformed and forgiven and changed. If you're a spouse who's been on the receiving end of consequences of sinful behavior, the Lord sees you, He knows you, He loves you. He wants you to know that. If you've grown up in a broken home and marriage is terrifying to you, the Lord wants to renew your, your thinking from his word and by his spirit. And let's keep remembering that our identity is found in Jesus and Jesus alone. If the band could come up, and if we could project Psalm 103 as the band's coming up. If we do Psalm 103, um, verses 1 through 13, I want to read Psalm 103, and I want to remind us of the good news of the grace of God. And you guys can all stand. We're going to sing here in a moment. Feel free to stand. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his way to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. Listen to this. The Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions From us, as a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for welcoming us into your family. Holy Spirit, may we be amazed at the forgiveness of sins that was made possible by Jesus, who is fully God and fully man, dying in our place. Would you minister to everyone as we sing this final song? ask this in your name. Amen.